Amen. Exodus 3 and 1. And it reads, Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in the flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight while the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither. Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters. For I know their sorrows, and I am come down to deliver them out of the hands of the Egyptians, and to them bring them up out of the a land unto a good land and a large unto a land flowing with milk and honey unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Pezzarites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now, therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me. And I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore. And I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said unto God, Who am I, he said, that I should go unto Pharaoh, and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with thee. And this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. And so here was Moses, and the Bible says he was on the, in the desert. He was, matter of fact, on the backside of, of the desert, and he was back there minding his own business, taking care of the flock. And the Bible says that a bush began to burn. And, the, and Moses, he was amazed because the bush was burning. I'm sure in the desert he had probably seen many a bush burn. But this, there was something different about this bush because this bush wasn't burning up. And as he, the Bible says, as he looked around at the bush, the Bible says that the Lord began to speak to him. And he began to, the Lord began to share with him the, what, the things that, that he was going to do and in the troubles that the nation of Israel was going through. And, and Moses heard all these things, and Moses said, who am I? He's like, wondering, why are you coming to me? Why are you coming to me telling me all this? He, he, he was wondering. He was, Moses was trying to get a handle on why God had chosen him and why God had, had, had decided to come to him in this manner to say, look, my people need to be free. And so today we're going to talk about and I'm going to minister on finding my identity. I'm going to say this to you again. Finding my identity. Moses, I'm sure, was confused because he had had kind of an interesting life. And, and, and him being on the backside of the desert was because of all the things he had gotten into in his previous life. And, and so Moses had found himself a new life. He had found himself a new identity. He had found himself a place to be. And I'm sure he was good. The Bible says that while he was on the backside of the desert, he got married. And he was tending to some flock, and I'm sure he probably had a home, and he had all these things going on. So for him, he was probably good where he was at. But God had a different identity for him. God had something different for him. And, and so today, the questions, the two questions I, I want to ask you today, and I want you to think about this today, is who are you? Or you could ask yourself, who am I? I want you to think about this. I want you to begin to think right now. Who am I? Who really am I? Who is God truly called me to be? What, what is my true identity? Because many times in life we walk around thinking that we're one person and God has called us to be something else. We, we think because of the decisions we have made and we think because we're wise because we've gone through this and seen that and we think that the place we're at is the best place for us. 
And so many times we begin to define who we think we are. But as you listen to this teaching, I really want you to ask yourself, who really am I? And number two, I want you to ask yourself, what am I called to do? Amen? And what I've found many times in this life, as we go through life, we begin to formulate our identities based on our experiences, what, what happened to us while we were little and what we experienced while we were little. And, and as we got older, whether we continued to school or whether we went out and did something else or maybe we went to the military or maybe we did this over here or started a business or whatever. And so many times in life, we begin to develop our identity based on our own decisions and based on our own experiences. When I was growing up, you may have said, well, I had a hard life and I and my daddy was a hard man. And so because my daddy was a hard man, I need to be a hard man. Or because I got beat up and beat down, you may say, when I grow up, I'm not going to be beat up and beat down. And so many times we develop our identity, we develop who we are based on the experiences that we have in life. And what we say we're going to do or what we say we're not going to do in this life. Amen? But how many of you know that God, from birth, from the time you were born, from the time you came out of your mother's womb, even from the time you were in your mother's womb, the Bible says that God knew you before you was born. He knew you when you were in your mother's womb. And, and through that, I understand that even in that moment, God had an identity for your life. And one thing I know that as we go through this life, even from what I've been through in my life, I know that through the entirety of your life, God is formulating your identity. He is working you to the place that he desires for you to be. He is working to the place that he has called for you to be. But many times we don't end up in the place or look at ourselves or perceive ourselves in the place that God has called us into. And so when we look at Moses, we see that Moses, when he was a child, they were, they were trying to kill the young boys. And so Moses found himself in the house of Pharaoh. And, and he found himself growing up in a place that he wasn't supposed to be in, but he grew up in royalty. And he grew up in a, a nice place. He grew up, grew up in the king's house. And so I'm sure as a young boy and growing up, he, he had an identity of being royalty to some extent because he grew up in the king's house. And, but the Bible says that when he got older, he knew he was an Israelite and he saw what was happening to his Israelite, to his brothers and sisters. And the Bible says he killed a man because of the offense he suffered. And so he went from being in the palace, being someone who was regarded, I'm sure, by many people just for the sake of being in the king's palace. He had a great identity, right? That's that man that lives in the king's palace. Even if they didn't know his name, his identity was that's that guy who's with the king. And so he was identified by his present circumstance. But the Bible says that as soon as he went out and he killed that man, then all of a sudden his identity changed. He went to a murderer. And it says that the king was upset and they were after him because he had killed that man. And so his identity became a murderer. But how many know that although while the world was looking at him as a murderer, how many know that God had a different identity for him? Amen? And, and so Moses, being that he, he was in a bad place and he had made a bad decision, he ran off into the desert. And he got in that place and he was trying to find just somewhere where he could have rest and he could have peace. And so he, he got out there and found him a life in the middle of the desert. He found him a wife. He found him something to do. He found him a family. He found someone to identify with. And so you could at that point say, well, Moses is a hardworking man. He had a bad past life or a crazy past life, but now he's a good, hardworking man, and, and he's taking care of his family, and that's who he is. But God had a different identity for him. And this is the thing I, I want us to, to get through and to understand is that many times the place we think we've gotten to and the place we think that we're at where we're going to be at and this is what we're supposed to do, many times God has a different designation for you. Many times God has a different identity even when you feel like everything is right where it's supposed to be. And that's why I tell people all the time, always be asking God, is this what I'm supposed to be doing? Is this where I'm called? to be. See, Moses was on the backside, and it was real, I'm sure it was real quiet back there. 
It was a real quiet and calm place. He tended the flock and he came home and he had some food and he relaxed and chilled and went out the next day and tended to the flock. But see, God didn't call him to chill and sit, and sit back and relax and tend to some flock. God had called him to be a disruptor. Amen. God had called him to go out and mess some stuff up. God had called him to go up and break up what the devil was trying to do to Israel and Egypt. Amen. But Moses couldn't see that because he was good where he was at. And so many times God has called us into places that we don't even have an idea. But I realized that even in all those things, God is constantly developing us. And he's constantly preparing us for who he has called us to be. And so I got down here a list, and it's God's development plan and how God moves on, on how he's going to develop. The first one I have down here is selection. Selection. God selects those. He, he chooses your identity. It's not us. It's not us that chooses who we are. It is God that chooses us and chooses who we are supposed to be. Turn your Bibles over to 1 Peter 2 and 9. 1 Peter 2 and 9. And it says, But ye are a chosen generation. It says a royal priesthood a holy nation of peculiar people. It says that ye should show forth the praise of him who were called out of darkness into his marvelous light. And that shows you right there that God is choosing, he's raising, he's identifying people. Amen. He has chosen you. Everyone in this place, God has chosen you. He has selected you for a particular purpose in your life. That is your identity. Amen. And no matter where you are in life and whether or not you're doing what he's called you to do or whether you're doing what he's called you to do, then he has identified you as that thing. Amen. And so we get to that place where we understand that God is constantly developing. And, and so he selects us. And, and, and then after our selection, God allows us to experience experiences, whether experiences that God has ordained or whether it's just life experiences. God allows us to go through things. Sometimes we become upset and frustrated because of all the pain and struggle we have in our life. And the Spirit of God has dealt with me about this. Sometimes we go through these things, but we don't even realize that we're going through these things because there's somebody else that we're supposed to minister to. There was somebody else that's going to be going through the same problem, but there had to be somebody else that came first and said, well, I've been through that also. I, I've dealt with that pain also. I've, I've dealt with that, that trouble also, but God delivered me out. And so God many times allows us to go through experiences to develop us. Sometimes it's negative experiences. Sometimes it's positive experiences. I know for me, I, I've had jobs in the past and stuff, and I ask myself, why am I doing this job? Lord, why do you have me doing this at this moment? And I didn't realize until I got into ministry that God was even developing me to minister. See, before I ever sat before people and ministered to people and preached the word, I was out teaching about something else. And I would have crowds of people, and I'd be training them and teaching them. People come to me and say, man, you do such an awesome job teaching. Man, you do a good job teaching. And I was just like, oh, okay, what's the big deal? I don't understand. But I realized that in that, God was developing me to be able to minister. But, but his identity wasn't me teaching about dental equipment. His identity wasn't for me to be an account manager. His identity was that I was a minister of Christ. But he was using my situation and my circumstance to prepare me for the identity he had for me in my life. God's development plan. Next thing, grace and spirit. So after the selection, after your experience, God also gives you grace and the power of the spirit. When I say grace and spirit, I'm talking about favor and the power of the spirit. Amen? And, and so when God has you an identity for you, in that identity, there is favor. Amen? How many people have been in their vein? They know they're in a place that God had called them to be, and because of that, doors open. 
Some of y'all know what I'm talking about. When you're in the place that God has designed and destined for your life, there's supernatural favor that just happens for you. You meet the right people, you interact, you're in the right places, and for some reason you're like, man, I ain't even know. There's been so many people where I'd be like talking to them and we realized we were in the same place, in the same mind, working on the same thing. Why? Because God has favor in your life because of your identity. Sometimes we're in a bad place because we don't know who we are. I said sometimes now. Sometimes we're in a bad place because we don't know who our identity is, what our identity is. And we're frustrated and we're agitated because no door will open, nothing will shift, no, nothing will move for us. But the Spirit of the Lord is saying, look, it's because you're not in the place that I've called you to be in. When you get in that place, favor will begin to move on your life. And not only favor, but the Spirit of the Lord will begin to move on your behalf. Let's go to Romans 8 and 28. Romans 8 and 28. And it reads, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who were called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he did also predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. And, and so it says right there that, look, all things, the part I want you to get is that all things work together for the good of them that are called by God, right? God works on your behalf. If you've called you into a place, if he's called you into a specific identity, then things are going to work out for your good. Even the situations that you thought was messed up. I realized that the, a lot of my good development happened in my most painful times, in my most difficult moments. I realized that when I came out, I was stronger than I ever was before. I realized that I thought clearer. I had a clearer perception. I had a stronger stance. Amen. Why? Because God allowed me to go through. Some of us don't want to go through things. And when we avoid things, sometimes we miss out on the development that God has for us in our life. Amen? Somebody got that revelation. Last thing here. Manifestation. Manifestation. And so God selects. He allows you to experience life. He gives you his grace and spirit. But then there's the manifestation of your identity, meaning that there is a visible appearance of your identity, meaning that it becomes obvious who you are. And that's when you begin to move in the place that God has called for you. It, it begins to be obvious to people. People start seeing, they can see it all over you. They, they, they know it's you. You know what I'm saying? They know that you're called to do that. Why? Because of the grace that's over your life. Now, I think about the story of David. And I think about how, you know, we know the story of David and how he was standing before Goliath. But when I was reading the scripture, I, I saw that, you know, David, well, when he was coming to the army, he wasn't coming to fight. He, he wasn't even thinking about fighting. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that he was told by his daddy to take the soldiers some corn, bread, and cheese. And some of you that are men understand that if folks are about to fight and they're having you take corn, bread, and cheese, you're probably not doing much, right? And, and, and so David was a little boy, and he was just taking some food to the warriors. And he saw Goliath standing there, and he saw Goliath talking all this stuff, and he saw the men that were afraid of Goliath. Now turn your Bibles over to 1 Samuel 17 and 24. And it says, And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were so afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man that has come up? Surely to defy Israel he has come up. And it shall be that the man who killeth him the king will enrich him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David spake to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine and taketh away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered after this manner, saying, So shall it be to the man that killeth him. And so right there, right there in that moment, 
we, we see that David was, was transitioning from being a, a, a bread carrier. He was transitioning from being, a, a, like we like to say, a water boy. He was transitioning from the identity of being just a little boy who come by and helped the soldiers out. Right there at that moment when David said, what shall it be done? That there was an identity shift that was going on in his life. God was beginning to bring him. Because see, with David and, and all those men, David knew that he could defeat Goliath. But all the other men, they didn't know. So David knew in his mind, he said, what shall be done? At that very moment, his identity was being established. At that very moment, there was a shift that was happening. At that very moment, there was a manifestation of who David was really supposed to be. There, there, was, a man, there was something that was happening that was beginning to expose and show who David was. And all the development that had gone on before. And so the men were confused about David because they could not understand how David could be sitting here talking about he want to fight this giant. What's he talking about? He don't even know how to hold a sword. He never even had a piece of armor on. What is he talking about? Get this. As God begins to raise you up into the place you're called to be, there'll be people around you confused and not understanding how you think that God's going to do that in your life. They will look at who they think you are. They will look at what they perceive you are, the strengths that you're perceived to have, and they'll pass judgment on the identity that you have. That's what happens. People do it all the time. And sometimes they'll look at, they'll look at how tall you are, how short you are. They'll look at the color of your skin. They'll look at whether you're a male or a female. And sometimes just off of that, they will determine what your identity is. Amen? But it doesn't matter what people think. It's what God says you are. And whatever God says you are, if you trust in him, he'll bring it to a reality in your life. And so that point of manifestation was happening. In David's life. And so he was contending with the man, and the man was like, Well, I don't know, David, David, he's such a little boy. But David was like, Look, I'll go fight him. I'll do it. And so they tried to give David armor. They said, Well, just give him the armor. He don't know how to use it, but just get armor to him. But the Bible says that David didn't take the armor. And he couldn't, he said, He hadn't, you ever used a sword before. He's just gonna go with what he had. But see what they didn't understand that David was already been developed. He had already been developed in obscurity, amen? God had already be built, been building him to the point where his identity would be manifested, amen? He, God had already been working on him. And, and we understand through Scripture that when David was talking about the fiend alive, he began to talk about how God had delivered him out of the lion. And he began to talk about how God had delivered him out of the bear. And so David had been through some pretty rough stuff already, but nobody knew, so they thought David was weak. But his identity was established in the wilderness with that bear. His identity was being built in the wilderness when he wrestled with that lion. And so the Bible says that he ran towards Goliath and he defeated him. And all that they promised, David received. God wants to raise some people up and begin to manifest your identity. Amen. There's some of you that have been going through uh, training, amen, in the back of the wilderness. There's some of you that have been being developed in obscurity. That there's some of you that God has put some special things and some identities. There is an identity he has placed in your life. And you've been developed for it. And all you see is the trouble you've had. And all you see is the pain and disappointment. And you haven't seemed to have done a lot. But God has identity that's reserved. Amen. And at some point, the identity that God has for you will begin to manifest. And people will say, well, where did she come from? Where did he come from? How did they go about, when, when was their training? <laughs> we want to understand, right? Because we want to see the process of how somebody got to this and how somebody got to that. And sometimes we have the wrong gauge on identity. We want to identify based on somebody something paid for to get. Not what God made them to be. I remember I was riding in a car one time with this gentleman, and we were doing some business for this company I worked for, and I was telling him about my grandmother, 
and I was telling her, him about how great of a minister she was. Not that she was my grandmother, but she was a great minister. She would spend 34 days locked in a, a prayer room that was built to itself and fast and had people's names on the wall and pray for them. That's all she would do. But when I, when I tell him, I was telling him about my grandmother and how she really was a prayer warrior and how she was a great woman of God. The first thing he said to me was, did she go to school for that? I'm not bad in going to school. I've been to school. A lot of y'all have been to school. There's nothing wrong with going to school. But sometimes I think we, when we're talking about the identity of God, we, we misplace what man has said is required for identity versus what God has, has required for identity. Because I know that my grandma was a lot more holy than a lot of these dudes walking around with PhDs. And they call themselves theologians, but they ain't going to spend one day praying for nobody. And so it's God that establishes identity, not man's designation. There's a lot of men and women that go around looking for designations for men. People that give you PhDs, doctorates, and all that, and you'll be acting a fool full of devils, and you'll be walking around, I'm Dr. Such and Such, and got full of devils on the inside. Because man will give you stuff without knowing the condition of your heart. But God gives you identity according to your heart. Amen? Amen? See, when you have identity in your life, it unlocks power, position, and purpose. I'm going to say this again. When you have identity, it unlocks power, position, and purpose. Amen? Turn your Bibles over to Matthew 8 and 28. And it reads, and when he was coming to the other side into the country of the Gergenesenes, there met him two possessed with devils coming out of the tombs exceeding fierce so that no man might pass by that way. And behold, they cried out saying, what have we to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of God? Art thou come hither to torment us before the time? And, and, and so you know, the, the, these men were, uh, they saw Jesus and, 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 well, they had devils on the inside of them and the demons saw Jesus. And what did they say? Lord, have you come to torment us before the time? See, Jesus had an identity of power. Amen. He had an identity of being the son of the most high God. He had the identity of someone who was bringing the judgment. And so immediately when those devils saw Jesus, what did they say? Have you come to judge us? Because they recognized the power of his identity. Amen. When you have identity, there's power. If somebody walks in and they're the president of the United States, no matter who they are, if they walk in and they're the president of the United States, automatically you're going to say, that's the president right there. Right? Because there's power that comes with their identity. But how much greater when you're identified as a child of the Most High God? Amen? How much greater if you're identified as the Lord Jesus Christ himself? There's power in the identity. There's power in who God has called you to be. Amen? Amen. But what I've seen is because Satan doesn't want you to get to that place of power, he doesn't want you to get to that place of identity, many times he'll attack you or come after you before you get to the rise into the place that God has called you into. And I've known stories, and I know my wife has told me about stories, and I feel like the enemy came at me. But we, we all have, some of us have stories about how the devil tried to kill us from birth. What was going on? He was trying to snatch away who he perceived you to be. He was trying to rob you of the identity and the place that you were going to walk in in this life. And so many times, Satan begins the warfare from a babe. He begins to warfare. That's why we have to pray over our children. That's, that's why we have to stand for our children and pray for them and stand with them. Because the devil starts his warfare even when it's on the inside of you. The devil starts his warfare very early, amen, because he's trying to snuff out the greatness that God has placed on the inside of you. Because he's looking at their identity. You see the story of Jesus and how when Jesus was born, King Herod was upset because he heard the Savior was born and, and there was some wise men going out and he said, look, 
He said, tell me, tell me where, where, where Jesus is. He said, I want to come worship him. But he wasn't trying to come worship him. He was trying to kill Jesus because he found out what his identity was. He found out he was the savior of mankind. And so we said, I got to, we got to do something with him. And so let's go look in scripture and see what happened. It says in Matthew 2 and 16, it says, Then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise men, was exceedingly wroth and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem. He killed all the kids because he was trying to get the one that had been identified as the son of the Most High God. And it says, In all the coast thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise men. So Herod was out. Of course, through the power of Satan, trying to destroy and get at that identity. Sometimes Satan, even if he doesn't know who we are, he'll pick at us, even if, if he has an inkling of what God has called you to be. That's why many times we don't even know what our identity is. Sometimes God doesn't reveal it because when it gets revealed, the warfare will begin. Satan doesn't attack you according to where you are. He attacks you according to who you are. That's one of the things I had to wrestle with. The devil was attacking me, and I was like, Lord, why am I going through this? I, I was like, I hadn't done anything. I'm just chilling. Why, why is the enemy attacking me like this? But I had to realize he wasn't attacking me for where it was. It didn't matter how much scripture I knew or didn't know. It didn't matter how holy it was or wasn't. He was attacking me because of who he perceived me to be. That's why it's important that you don't go out and name yourself or call yourself things that God has not called you to be. Because Satan may be looking at you and trying to figure out who you are, and then you go profess things. Oh, they must be that. And he begin to attack you like that. And if you're not properly equipped, remember I told you that with identity comes power, position, and purpose? If you're trying to operate in a place that God has not identified you in, and then Satan begins to attack you like the identity he perceives you to have, you might find yourself in a bad place. God, why are you not moving on my behalf? Well, because I ain't calling you to do that. Why does not any favor? Because I, that's not where I've ordained for you to be. That's why in this church we try to make sure that people walk in the identity that God has called them into. Because in that there will be favor, there's power, there's authority that walks with your identity. Amen? Amen. Let's go over to Acts 19 and 23. And it reads, then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, saying, we adjure you by Jesus whom Paul preaches. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and a chief of the preach, priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, Paul I know, but what? Who are you? Who are you? I don't even know who you are. You're talking all this stuff. And what, what happened? The Bible says the devil ripped their clothes off, and that must have been a sight, right? All these men ran up out the house naked. I'm sure they were screaming, too, because they got beat up. But they went in there with authority. Come out, devil, in the name of Jesus, who Paul preaches. The devil's like, what? I don't even know who you are. That's a problem with some people. People walk around name dropping. Name dropping Jesus and not even identified with him. Don't call Jesus' name unless you're rolling with him. Because trust me, the devils know who with Jesus is not. They know if you identify with Christ and if you're not identified with Christ. But that's what people do, right? A lot of folks are calling Jesus' name when they're about to die, but they may have never called his name while they were living. And so we have to be careful that if we're going to call the name of Jesus, let us be identified with Christ. Amen? Last thing, last thing. Some keys to finding identity. Some keys to finding identity. Now, this subject is really, the whole idea of finding identity is really close to me because I went through some years of ministry without understanding who I was. And I, and I believe that God allowed me to go through this because he wanted me to have an understanding of how important it was to really know your identity. Not just the identity of being a child of God, 
Many of us, when we receive Christ, we stop at the identity of being a child of God. Okay, I'm a child of God. All right. But we don't, we don't realize that being a child of God, there's more. Like, I can say I'm James. I'm James, but my finger is different from my elbow, and my elbow is different from my kneecap. My kneecap is different from my foot. And, 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 and so although all of this is James and James's body, that there are different functions and different parts. And so while this is James, this is identified as what a hand, right? And so his identity within itself is a hand. You see what I'm saying? And, and that's what happens to us as Christians is that we identify as the whole, but we don't identify as the individual mandate that God has placed over our lives. And so we become confused. What if your hand said it wanted to talk? I guess you could do sign language, but if your hand actually wanted to talk, it can't talk, right? Because it's not built to talk. It's built to hold things. What if your foot said it wanted to eat some food? Can't do much, can it? Because while it's associated with your body, it's not identified as something that eats. But it can sure enough walk better than your mouth can. And so in the body of Christ, we have gotten confused about who we are. And so the foot is trying to eat and the mouth is trying to walk and the elbow is, is, is trying to see things. And, and we're all confused and wondering why we don't have favor and the grace of God moving in things. Well, it's because we don't know who we really are. And we don't understand who God has called us to be. And so number one, some keys to find identity, ask God who you are. Ask him. Don't assume. Assume he gets us in trouble. You ever assume something? We all fall for it. It don't matter how seasoned or unseasoned you are. We're gonna, sometimes you just say, well, that must be that. And sometimes it's not. We need to ask God, especially for something that important. We need to ask God, Lord, who have you called me to be? Forget about where I'm at. Forget about whether I'm comfortable. You know, when God called Moses out of the desert, Moses was already comfortable. He called him into a place of uncomfortableness. I don't know if that's a word, but it sounds good, right? Amen? And so, and so God called Moses out of his place of rest into a place of turmoil. But that's where he was supposed to be because that's what his identity was to deal with all that mess. And so I ask him, Lord, who have you ordained me to be? Who have you called me to be? What, what, is, what is your mandate for my life? What is my identity? I, I know I'm in a good place right now. See, uh, well, a lot of us are smarter here. We got smart folks in here. You know, we go through life, we find that place where we're comfortable, right? Maybe you got all your bills paid, you got a little extra to put in savings. Maybe you have a lot. Maybe you got a couple of businesses you own. Maybe you're doing this and that or whatever. But if you ever just sat down, and sometimes it's scary because you can accumulate and do all these things, and it's scary when you come to God and say, God, am I doing what I'm supposed to do? Because you're scared God going to tell you that you need to let all that stuff go. I done built a lot of stuff. <laughs> I'm not ready to let all this stuff go. But that's what happens, right? We're scared because we don't want the God to detach us from our comfort zone. We build us a nice little comfort zone. Especially here in America. If you want to be comfortable, you can build you a comfortable, comfortable space. Make your little money, buy your little house, get your car, get everything taken care of, and just not have no problems. You can get you, you can build your comfort, but God may not have called you to that comfortable space. He may have, you may be like Moses. God may have called you to tear some stuff up. He may have called you to punch the devil in his mouth. And all of us know you can't be punching the devil in the mouth and think you're gonna sit at home at your house and just sit back and relax. You're going to have to fight. And so ask God. Don't be scared. Don't be scared. It's okay. The sooner you ask him, the better you'll be. Because you'll get through your entirety of your life, and then you'll realize that you missed the place that God had ordained for you. So ask God who you are. Number two, ask God what you are to do. It kind of flows in the same vein. Ask God what you're supposed to do. Okay, God, who am I and what do you want me to do in this season? Now, this is where some people mess up when it comes to identity. Sometimes, like, like with Moses, God didn't call Moses to deliver the nation of Israel when he was five years old. But he was going to be the person who was going to deliver the nation of Israel, you see? And, and, and so asking God, what do I do in this season? What am I called to do at this moment? That's essential to identity because there may be some development process that God is still taking you through. 
There may be some things he needs to get to. He's not ready for you to be visible in what he's called you to do. There may be some things he has to develop in you. That's why, that's why I talk to some of these people who are calling themselves prophets and stuff and telling people everything. Some folks ain't not meant, some things not meant to be revealed to people. It may not be the time that says, I remember I had this person, God that showed me something about this person, and the Lord said, but don't tell him. This person went off somewhere else, and some prophet at a random event, he went to, and the prophet said, God told you to do this, or call, called you to be this. And he come back and asked me about it. And I said, well, yeah, God just recently told me that. He said, but don't tell me. I was just like, oh, man. I was like, yeah, you found out before you were supposed to. But that's what happens. And then what happens when people find out things before they're supposed for instance, I'll give you an example. Say you out sweeping up somewhere. If somebody works sweeping up somewhere, I'm not, I'm not talking down a bad about sweeping up somewhere. But say you out sweeping up somewhere and you've been sweeping up for a long time and, 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 and you're good with it. But then somebody comes to you and says, you know, you, you actually gonna be the CEO of this company. The next day you go in to sweep up, it's gonna be hard for you to pick up that broom. The next day, your boss comes to you and says, you need to sweep up that floor again. You're going to be like, well, I'm going to be the CEO anyway, so I ain't even worried about it. Sometimes our heart is not prepared for who, what God has called us to be. There may be some development, so sometimes he may not tell you, but he'll give you instruction for this moment. He said, do this right now. And then I reveal to you. Even when I started the church, the Lord wouldn't even tell me who I was when I started the church. When I first opened up the doors, he told me to get a warehouse, start having service. I got the warehouse, started having services. And so I said, well, okay, I must be Pastor James. And so I started having service, put on my flyers, Pastor James. And it took me two years, almost, almost three years, to come to the revelation I was an apostolic anointing than a pastoral anointing. And those of y'all who understand that, but it was a different type of anointing. But I realized I had to go through that to get to a place where I could receive it. See, because the apostolic anointing was not something I was going after. It was not something I desire. And if God had said it to me, I'd probably be like, is that God? That's how we do sometimes. When God gives us an identity, we say, uh, when we want to hear, what, if he says, you're supposed to be wealthy, you can receive that, right? Oh, praise the Lord. God bless him. But when God tells you something or identifies you as something that you, you're not really interested in, I'm going to have to fast and pray on that one. <laughs> i got to seek clarity. That's what we do, right? Because of the heart. You're ready to receive when it's something you want, right? But, but you, you struggle, you strain, and then, you, know, you need to pray and fast and you know, read Scripture. Well, i got to find that in the Scripture. Is that in the Bible? You know what I'm saying? You know, i got to make sure there ain't no devil speaking to me. You know, you know we, we come with all these excuses because we cannot receive because it's not necessarily what we want it. And so for me, God had to put me in a, a building to have me praying and crying out to him for two years before I could embrace, truly embrace what he had called me to do. You see? Next thing, number three, have peace in your identity. Have peace of who God calls you to be. See, when you, when you get in a place where you fully embrace who God's, you're not worried about what everybody's got going on. You know, I see so many people who every time they see somebody doing something, they go out and want to do it too. Because they, 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 they don't understand who they are. Oh, you're doing this? I want to do it. You're doing that? I want to do that. That drives me up the wall. Because I know they're not doing it because they're anointed or called or identified in that. They're doing it because they see it and they're like, oh, that's great. I'm going to do that too. They don't have their identity. When you know who you are, you're not worried about what everybody's got going on. You ain't never seen me up here trying to lead pray to worship, praise and worship, have you? Because I know that's not my lane. Amen. My daddy made sure I understood when I was growing up, it's not my lane. Every time I'd sing around the house, he'd be like, son, you're not called into that. <laughs> so he, he, let, he, he established that real early. So I, I'm, I'm not trying to get up and lead praise and worship, amen? But the ones that do, I, I said, praise God, take them higher and higher and higher. You see? But that's sometimes we, we do that. We see other people doing that. I've seen people who, have, who don't have anointing to sing, and they sing, and they got albums and everything, and I'm just like, you're not called into that. Huh? No, don't say that. Okay, I won't say that. 
Some people call this stuff, some people hate. Some people not called to sing. Even if they want to, maybe you call to sing in your shower, okay? Some people are not anointed to sing. They're just not. Some people are not anointed to do other things. I mean, I'm not, I'm not picking on singing, but I'm, I'm just giving you an example, you know, is that sometimes we're pursuing things that we're not ordained to do. When you're ordained to do it, the grace comes out of it. People say, well, how'd you do that? The grace is, a, it just happens. It, you do it at a whole other level. When you're called and you're identified as something, it, it operates and it moves at a whole different level. And you, like I said, you just manifest out the blue. Because that's who you are. Because there's a grace on it. The reason why we're able to just move in media like we do is because there's a grace of media. There's favor in media. But some things are not, there's not grace and favor there. Just leave it alone. Just leave it alone. Let it be. You see? So have peace in who you are. Have peace. Whatever God's telling you to do for right now, have peace in it. Be okay. Be all right. Don't get upset. Don't get frustrated. Don't feel like people are getting ahead of you in this and that or whatever. Somebody, sometimes we look at where other people are at, we feel like we're getting behind. I ought to be doing more. I ought to be achieving more. I ought to be doing this. Don't worry about that. God, God got y'all on two different timelines. You see, sometimes we try to lockstep our time with somebody else. God got you on two different timelines. Don't worry about it. Have peace in your identity. Number four, don't let people define. This is big. Don't let people define who you are. Don't let people define you. Let God define you. Because people will make you this and make you that and take you all over here, whatever. You know, let God define who you are. Has somebody ever told you something and it just didn't sit well with your spirit? Be careful of that. People will define you. People, even from children, people will define their children. And I say, oh, you know, my son is going to be a such and my daughter going to be a such and such or whatever. But, you know, a lot of times they don't end up being there. And, of course, as parents, we want them to be those great things or whatever. But sometimes it's just not who they are. My mama wanted me to be a doctor. I was not a doctor. She wanted me to be that, but that wasn't my identity. And for a second, I, I, even though I wasn't doing good in biology, for a second I was like, I'm going to try to be a doctor. Because I was letting her set my identity. But I told her, I said, you know, I told her recently, I said, I thank the Lord because God gave you a doctor in my sister. Because I wasn't called to be a doctor. <laughs> and, 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 and so, you know, we have to be careful because sometimes we, we become things because we love the people who want us to be things. But we have to be who God has set us to be. Not who, we, not who we set ourselves to be, but who God has set us to be. Because the world wants to give you an identity also, right? The world wants you to choose your, just choose your identity. Who, who you want to be? You want to be a toaster? Be a toaster. <laughs> wanna be a, there was a man suing because he wanted to marry his toaster. Or it was a computer. He was suing because of that. He, he wanted to, you know what I'm saying? And, and so, so, you know, the world wants you just to choose whatever. What has God called you to be? What has God identified you as? Be that. And don't get caught up in appearances. Stick to the spiritual reality. Sometimes we wrestle with appearance. Sometimes people label you according to your appearance. I've been in church service before, and... A woman prayed for a woman, and she told her to come out the club, and she was a, a powerful woman of God, but she was, through her own perceptions, my wife laughing about that, through her own perceptions, she looked at her, and because maybe she was just young, she said she must be in the club because she's young. And, and, and so she told her to come out the club, but the woman was a woman of God. And so we have to be careful because we will identify people based on how they look. I got an uncle that'll walk in here right now with a sweatsuit on, baseball cap, and, and, and some Jordans. And you'll think he a brother just doing his thing. And he's a surgeon. And that's how he dresses all the time, though. But, but sometimes we judge people based on their appearances. And we think, well, if you're a surgeon, you had to walk around with a three-piece suit on. You see? And, and, and so people will label you based on your appearance. But you need to be 
identify with who God has called you to be. There's what things appear to be, and there there's the reality or the spiritual reality of where God has called you. Amen? Everybody, please stand. My desire is for everyone in here, first, know you're a child of the living God, but also, secondly, I desire for everybody to know what God has called them to do. And I, and I desire you to have peace in what God has called you and what God has called you to do. And for you to, to do it with gladness, for you to do it with joy. And can we have some music? Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I didn't realize. But I, I desire for, for everybody to, to embrace where God has called them to be and what God has called for them to do. And do it with gladness and do it with joy. And don't worry about what everybody else got going on. And don't worry even if the, the, the things you're doing with your identity has not been received or people can't see or perceive or understand what you're doing. But just know that at the point in time, God is going to manifest and people will see the greatness that's in you. Amen? Amen. So right now, I just want to pray over the church. I'm going to pray that in your heart, you receive who God has called you to be and that your identity, that you embrace it as your own. Amen? Heavenly Father, we come to you in the name of Jesus. We bless your holy name in all things. We give honor to you, Lord Father. We thank you, Lord Father, for your tender mercy. We thank you for this word today, Lord. We thank you, Lord Father, that, that confidence and encouragement, Lord Father, has flowed into the hearts of the people, Lord Father. That anyone, Lord Father, is struggling with who you have ordained for them to be. They're struggling with their gifts, their callings, their talents, Lord Father. I pray today, Lord Father, that they may grab on, Lord Father, and do as you have called, Lord. Let them not be concerned about other people or what their friend or their cousin and them are doing. Let them be concerned about those things. But let them be focused on you, Lord, and everything that you have ordained for their life. In Jesus' name. I break the power of jealousy, Lord, in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name. We thank you, Lord, for your mercy. We thank you for your power and authority, Lord Father. Anoint this place with purpose and identity. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen, amen. Um, if you're not standing, come.